Hello folks and welcome back to English 306 with me, Dr. Matt Barton. Uh, and in this lecture I want to uh, very, very briefly uh, go over chapter 3 of uh, Bishop's book, Rise of the New Paradigm. And I hope you enjoyed this chapter. Uh, I liked it because it's about one of my favorite movies, Night of the Living Dead. Uh, absolutely uh, classic horror film. You know, I'm excited about uh, you getting to watch this. I mean, there's been a lot of remakes, and you know, it's got it's not a perfect film by, by any means, uh, but it's just so uh, interesting to me. And it's probably one of the first truly uh, scary movies I ever saw. Uh, I remember watching this at midnight. I think it was Halloween at midnight, and they showed it on MTV. <laughs> this is back when you know you couldn't just watch whatever you wanted to watch when you wanted to watch it. You know, you kind of had to work around a broadcast schedule. And my parents uh, were also big fans of uh, this movie. I'd never seen it before. I think I was like 11, 10 or 11. Uh, so they had the bright idea uh, of uh, letting me uh, stay up and watch this with them. And <laughs> I, mean, I don't think I slept for a week. <laughs> uh, scared the uh, ever-living, you know, crap out of me. Uh, and it was just something I, I thought about ever since. You know, what made, you know, I've seen other scary movies, but... They, you know, it never, uh, nothing else has ever really uh, had that lingering, you know, having nightmares about it like weeks and months, even years later. Uh, no other film has done that for me, you know. Frankenstein, vampire stuff, you know, werewolves, uh, whatever. <laughs> it might be scary while I'm watching it, uh, but I don't really tend to think about it, you know, all this time later the way this movie does. So it's one of the reasons I wanted to do um, you know, explore this in the context of pop culture. Just try to figure out what is it that makes this, you know, these this zombie movie, at least this one in particular, so scary. And whereas all this other stuff, you know, again, might be a little scary while you're in the theater, but, you know, you're not really scared about it uh, <laughs> the next day, uh, much less uh, years later. So that was one of the questions I had that brought me to this uh, subject. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, just in passing, if you are curious about how uh, they made this movie, you should watch this documentary called Birth of the Living Dead. I'm not sure where all this is. Well, that didn't help. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure where this is available. I didn't check. You should probably find it for free somewhere. Uh, but this goes into a lot of detail about how they made the movie, and you learn things like Romero was not a professional filmmaker. He, he wasn't like, uh, you know, George Lucas or Spielberg, you know, nothing like that. I mean, this was a guy that was making his money filming uh, commercials, like the local TV stations, you know, back in the, I guess, uh, throughout the 60s. <laughs> so uh, then he, he saved up his money, his, all his pennies and dimes, I guess, from doing that, and sort of made this film, Nigh the Living Dead. You know, it didn't do so well at first, but then it got sort of circulated as this cult classic film. It kind of bundled in with the, what they called these uh, double feature films. So you'd go watch... Uh, for the price of one movie ticket, you could watch two movies. <laughs> of course, they weren't like the best movies. You know, it was like these older movies. Uh, and now The Living Dead got sort of mixed in with that. And people liked it so much, they kept asking, you know, hey, we want to see that again. And it kind of became, a, I guess, kind of a sleeper hit, I guess you could call it. Uh, but anyway, nowadays it's considered, again, one of the great classics. Uh, if you uh, want to watch something funny about it, you can look for Riff Tracks, R-I-F-F-T-R-A-X, uh, they have a version of this. I think it's on Amazon Video, but they sort of riff over it and tell a lot of jokes. <laughs> uh, it's a lot of fun, so you might want to check that out, too. Uh, but anyway, let's get into the uh, the movie here, or into the chapter, rather. Uh, so Bishop says, The horror of this and other zombie movies comes from recognizing the human in the monster, and the terror of such films comes from knowing there's little to do about it but destroy what is left. So that's where Bishop wants to take us. So how do we get to this point? You know, we'll see how he connects all the dots. Okay, so in this lecture, I've got three objectives. And again, very, very brief. I'm not going to go into, you know, fine detail. You can, you can certainly read it for yourself if you want that. Uh, I just want to gloss over sort of what he sees as being the main influences of the progenitors or basically what came before, what led up to Night of the Living Dead. Talk a little bit about that. Uh, get into this uh, weirdo, mind-blowing concept of Freud's, the Unheimlich, or the uncanny, and, and how that pertains to Night of the Living Dead. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about how Bishop says, or his argument that this movie is actually a bit of a social commentary on the Vietnam War and some other uh, events, troubling events, some crises, basically, 
uh, that were going on back in the, the 60s. All right, so what were Romero's inspirations for the film? You know, these things don't pop out of nowhere. There's always something you can point to that, you know, they, well, it's got this in common or this was done before in this film and so on and so forth. Uh, so he gives us lots of stuff. Some I'm pretty sure that Romero probably did not read, but nevertheless, you know, it's sort of a, it's an earlier thread. Uh, Stoker's Dracula is a great uh, novel. You probably heard of Dracula before, at least I hope. <laughs> <laughs> a movie with uh, Bela Lugosi, by the way, same guy that was in White Zombie uh, with the eyes. Uh, he does the best Dracula I've ever seen. I mean, <laughs> absolutely a riveting uh, performance. If you, and that, it's freely available. You can watch that. Uh, but anyway, uh, this, this idea of the vampire uh, looking human, except, you know, for the fangs, having these uh, superpowers and turning other people into vampires. You know, you can see there's a connection there. There's a lot in common with zombies. Uh, Shelley's Frankenstein. Uh, now this is a little different. If you've only seen the movies or like the monsters or something, uh, you know that that the that's not the same Frankenstein monster uh, that you get in the book. So if, you know, if you read uh, Shelley Mary Shelley's uh, Frankenstein novel, uh, the Frankenstein mon the doctor the creator the scientist is Doctor Frankenstein and the monster. Uh, I don't know if he's ever named in the book Prometheus or something. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'm blanking on the details, but I just remember that the uh, Frankenstein monster can talk and it's got a personality, or he's got a personality, he's a character, he's a round character, not a flat character. Uh, but anyway, there's certainly some, some overlap there too, you think he's sort of composed of these dead body parts, put them together, some electricity, <laughs> and it sort of looks human, but it's not really human. Uh, Stevenson's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, you know, he makes a Pretty compelling uh, comparison to that story. Uh, so that's some of the literature that you could look at. And there's a couple others. I think there's a Willa Cather story. A uh, couple other things he mentions. Uh, then we've got some movies. Uh, Hitchcock, these are probably more likely. I'm pretty sure Romero would have seen all of these. Uh, Hitchcock's The Birds in uh, 1963. It's a, it's a really good movie. Uh, it's surprisingly scary. It's another one I watched as a kid. didn't scare me quite as bad as... Uh, Night of the Living Dead, uh, but what makes that one scary is it's got it's about a bunch of little kids. You know, so if you're a little kid watching this, <laughs> it's, it's kind of double scary because uh, you uh, you know Night of the Living Dead. There's no small children in that, obviously. Uh, whereas the birds, you know, it's about these kids at a school and you know these crows and ravens and things are out <laughs> trying to peck out their eyes. <laughs> so pretty frightening stuff. Uh, An Invasion of the Body Snatchers. That one's from the fifties. Kind of sci-fi, you know, these people pop out of pods and uh, they look like humans or they, they look like your aunt or your uncle, your mom, your dad, whatever. But uh, your real mom or dad has been captured, kidnapped, and replaced with this sort of alien look-alike. Uh, so that's sort of the idea of that with that movie. And then uh, Last Man on Earth, 1964. That's now, I'm going to recommend two things for you. Now, read the story, I Am Legend. That is uh, Matheson. A little short story. You can probably find it free online somewhere if you just want to read it. Really good stuff. And then there's a couple of movies, actually three or four different movies based on that story. Uh, one is The Omega Man with uh, Charlton Heston. Uh, there's a uh, Last Man on Earth that came out fairly recently with uh, Will Smith, I believe, playing that. But the one that I like the best is uh, this one that's mentioned here, 1964, Vincent Price. One of my favorite actors, totally underrated. I mean, he gets sort of pigeonholed as this you know, campy sort of horror guy. But man, watch that movie from 1964 again. You can find it for free. Uh, really, really good. Uh, but the idea of that is, uh, you know, spoiler alert, uh, when you find out that the people that he's been, or the monsters that he thinks, you know, he thinks he's been out there killing monsters this whole time. Uh, he's the only man and everybody else has turned into a vampire. And so he's out there trying to... Uh, weed out what he thinks are monsters but you know by the end of the story you figure out that actually he is the monster <laughs> you know from there he's got sort of the wrong point of view Like right? from their point of view they're trying to rebuild civilization and society uh, and he is the monster you know, he's the legendary monster basically and it's a really cool story and i don't think that that little bit won't spoil it for you if you want to watch it because uh, i mean the fun part of that is just watching vincent price do his thing uh, all right, what makes vampires and zombies scary? Uh, so um, 
A couple of points that Bishop makes about this, and I think he's right. Uh, one is that if, you know, you have all these movies from about that time, like the giant bugs, uh, there's one called Them, like giant ant, giant, uh, you know, ape, uh, that, that sort of monster, <laughs> or you have something like the creature from the Black Lagoon, you know, uh, they don't look anything like uh, a regular person. It's kind of far out. You never see anything. You're never going to see a, a giant lizard, <laughs> a giant a Gila monster or anything. Uh, so it's probably not, it might be, again, scary to watch the movie, but you know, it just you never really encounter anything like that in real life, so it doesn't really make that uh, impact on you. Uh, whereas the zombies and vampires do look very human-like. And again, if you look at this, uh, we'll talk in a second here about this Unheimlich or the Uncanny Valley. Uh, there's something where your brain recognizes the human face, it recognizes the, uh, the human shape. You know, sometimes uh, you ever walk into a dark room and you see a, a shape, you know, an out, a shadow in the background that looks like a human, you know, whoa, whoa, you know, he's real startled. <laughs> and you flip on the light and it's just, you know, a coat rack or hat rack or something. Uh, so even that little bit of a, you know, what happened there is your brain sort of had this, uh, made this identification. So, oh, look at the pattern, you know, that's the person. Uh, you find out it's not, you know, and it's kind of freaks you out a little bit, right? Your, that, that switch, that toggle. Uh, going back and forth real quick. Again, we'll get it, we'll get it more into that in a second. Uh, yeah, so the zombie makes you, un on the one hand, you know, it's a dead body. You know, some of these zombies are walking around with, like, their guts hanging out, okay? Uh, so when you look at that, you think, well, you know, I've got guts. You know, actually, I'm immortal. I'm going to die one day. And you we don't tend to want to sit around thinking about our own impending <laughs> death. <laughs> you know, at least not mo many of us want to. Uh, I guess if you like uh, gothic music and, and heavy metal, you might enjoy thinking about that all the time. <laughs> Death metal. <laughs> uh, but most people, they don't want to be reminded of this. So it's like out of sight, out of mind. They want to repress uh, this information somehow. Uh, so anyway, that's one of the reasons it makes zombies scary. Um, and Because they do confront you with this reality, right? Uh, and two, that triggers this uncanny effect I've been telling you about by reminding you of something familiar but in a sinister fashion. Uh, so I think that's, he's right about these two things. You know, what really makes the zombie scary, and there's a scene that almost every zombie show has, you'll see it in The Walking Dead time and time again, right, where they're, you know, this is your son, your daughter, your mom, you know, your uncle, whatever, brother. Uh, and you see them and they look a lot like your brother, your, you know, who, your loved one. So you don't really want to say, well, actually, this is not them. This is a zombie now. This is, this is not my brother anymore. This is a zombie, and my brother is going to eat me. <laughs> I am going to become zombie chow uh, if I don't uh, you know, snap out of this and, and realize that it's not actually my, my brother here, but a zombie who happens to look like them. And I, you know, I think Bishop is absolutely right. That is scarier, a lot scarier than if it was just some random you know, giant Gila monster <laughs> type situation. <laughs> you know, there's something about sort of feeling like this is your family, something familiar, but now it's something very deadly. Uh, that's, uh, you know, really gets at your insecurities, right? You thought you were secure. Uh, it turns out you kind of pulls the rug out from under you. Uh, yeah, and then a bishop uh, talks about, you probably noticed this right off the bat when you watch the film, but these are not zoo, uh, zoo? Uh, voodoo zombies, like we saw in White Zombie and been reading about in the last chapter. Uh, they're not made with a powder. There's not a voodoo priest uh, controlling these things. They're not working in a, you know, sugarcane factory. <laughs> Nothing like that. Uh, instead, they kind of uh, just, they, they sort of have this, uh, I guess, sort of an instinctual drive. You know, they're looking to feed. Uh, they want to eat people uh, and kill. You know, they get up and kill. There doesn't seem to be much rhyme or reason to it. Uh, they've really just, you know, they're sort of humans that have been reduced to just pure appetite. Appetite being uh, eating. You know, they don't talk. <laughs> they don't try to argue with you. Not like in uh, that movie I was telling you about earlier. This uh, uh, last man on earth, you know, when the vampires show up, they're trying to break into the house, but they talk. You know, they, they're like saying uh, his name and uh, trying to get him to come outside so they can uh, feed on him, right? Uh, the zombies don't really do that here. You might have heard zombies say, brains. Okay, that's not Night of the Living Dead. 
uh, that is a film called Return of the Living Dead, and it's a parody movie, <laughs> and it's god awful, and I highly recommend it to you. It's hilarious. <laughs> R-rated, you know. I'm not gonna show it to the class because it's uh, pretty risque. Uh, but if that doesn't bother you, you should, you should watch that movie for sure. It will crack you up. You will be laughing hysterically. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see what else is here. Uh, Yes, uh, so remember when we talked a little bit about that weird concept with the master and slave dialectic? I hate the way that, the words they use for that theory. Uh, but anyway, uh, I think Bishop is correct here. Uh, so instead of having uh, like this voodoo master controlling the zombie, sort of being the master of the zombie and so on and so forth, here the, if anybody's a master, it's the zombies. Because uh, they want to uh, turn you, uh, turn people... Uh, into themselves, right? Or join the zombie ranks. If they don't eat you completely, <laughs> I suppose, <laughs> uh, then you'll get up and you'll join them, uh, and then you'll sort of obey the uh, sort of the ultimate herd mentality. If you think about it, uh, they have no regard for even the most extreme cultural taboos, such as cannibalism. Uh, yes, you, you think about bad behavior. <laughs> you know, you can do a lot of terrible things, but I think. We would all agree that eating somebody is way up there. <laughs> like, that is definitely a no-no. Uh, we do not condone uh, that. Uh, but yet these zombies are going around doing it like it's, uh, you know, they're having a Sunday brunch. You know, they might as well be at a, an old country buffet, the way they're acting uh, towards cannibalism. All right, zombie films. Uh, this is just a quick point that I wanted to make because I think it's, it's such a smart insight. But, you know, again, you see zombie films, you don't really see a lot of zombie novels or stories before Romero and uh, movies like White Zombie. And uh, Bishop says the reason for that is it just doesn't really work because the, in a story, because these characters are very, very flat. You know, if you remember that when we talked about narrative perspective, like a flat character, there's not anything interesting, they're very predictable, you know, exactly what they're going to do, there's nothing surprising, they don't develop at all, uh, which makes them very, very boring they're very, like a stereotype, extreme, I'm trying to read a story with flat characters. But it's better in a cinema because then you can see them walking around and you see all the stuff hanging off, the guts hanging off of them and stuff. So that, that sort of makes it visually interesting uh, in ways, I guess, that are harder to uh, capture in written form. Although I will say that since, uh, you know, I don't know when, but I guess Bishop wrote this, 2000 and something. Uh, but there's been lots of uh, great zombie novels since then. Uh, there's uh, Max Brooks did a survival book about them. Uh, there is uh, books based on The Walking Dead that are really, really good, highly recommended. Um, but you notice what they tend to do there is the zombies aren't aren't the main villains, main antagonists. It's like usually the zombies are there sort of in the background, but it's really about somebody like the governor, who's uh, an interesting villain, but he's not a zombie. See what I'm saying? He's a, a round character. Okay, so moving on then. Uh, he also makes some points about how one of the things that makes the movie so scary is it's not, again, too far-fetched. It's, it, okay, it's far-fetched in the idea we've got people uh, dying and, and waking up and trying to eat other people. Okay, that's unrealistic. Thank God. Uh, however, in other ways, it's very realistic, very humble, mundane even. You know, we're not uh, working with beautiful, professional Hollywood actors, you know. Uh, there's no, like, super smart people or superheroes or people that are beyond just or and basically these are just ordinary common everyday folks uh, you know that's the idea so you can relate pretty easily to them you probably know people like the ones in the movie uh for good or ill <laughs> they might annoy you <laughs> uh, but you probably know somebody like them uh, and the same thing with the farmhouse it's just a regular old house out in the wood you know not in the woods per se but you know sort of a country house a farmhouse okay uh, you've probably been in a place like that before. It's not like a castle somewhere or in space. You know, it's just nothing fantastic or, you know, uh, over the top here. It's just very common uh, people in a common setting. Uh, and that's important, according to Bishop, because what it, what it allows Romero to do. So he's got these really common, familiar sorts of people and places, but then he makes it scary. He sort of turns it around, switches back and forth between, oh, now you think you're safe. <laughs> oh, guess what? Now you're not safe. Uh, you think you're ni nice and secure in this farmhouse, but, you know, now there's an arm, uh, a dead uh, a dead person's arm coming through the window. Oh, my God. Uh, so you start to feel like, oh, I thought I was safe, but now I'm, I'm not safe. I thought this was familiar. 
uh, you know, what could be more familiar? You know, here's, here's Uncle Buck, Uncle Bob. <laughs> what about Bob, you know? Uh, now Bob's a zombie, and he's trying to come into my nice, safe environment. And so it's playing around with this concept of this uncanniness, uh, the uncanny. Uh, he also says that this house hides, this is thinking at a, about a cultural level now, he says it hides the repressed traumas and anxieties of society, but not successfully. The repressed cultural cultural quandaries keep coming back. And so this is, again, a reference to the 1960s when you have all of these uh, movements going on, the hippies, Woodstock, uh, civil rights marches, uh, assassinations. I mean, it's a pretty tumultuous time. You know, I think we might be able to give it a run for its money. You know, what do, what do you think? <laughs> uh, with our recent event, recent uh, history, I suppose. Uh, but nevertheless, there was this idea that, look, all this troubling stuff, we don't know what to make of all this stuff we're, we're watching on the news. I mean, it's Vietnam's horrible stuff. Uh, so you kind of want to repress that, feel like you're nice and safe. You know, you, basically, this, it's that idea that could never happen here. I mean, all that stuff could never happen here. Here we're safe. Uh, so Bishop is basically saying that this, this movie's kind of tapping into that anxiety that uh, maybe you're not. You know, maybe this is a facade you're trying not to think about that stuff. You're trying to repress it, but it just is going to find a way to, uh, you know, to break into your uh, house. <laughs> uh, so you say it can't happen here, but it's going to come in through the window like that zombie arm one day. Uh, so it's pretty unsettling. Yeah, Romero argues that the movie is a devastating criticism of 1960s culture. So I just put the quote here for you. It says, in quite simple terms, when confronted with the grim and frightening realities of mortality, the human characters of Night of the Living Dead prove themselves incapable of coping. Just as America in 1968 was suffering under a similar inability to cope with both climatic social changes and the stark realities of death. So basically people were becoming uh, disillusioned, sort of the way, you know, they're... <laughs> <laughs> uh, kind of what's the phrase uh, a rude awakening I suppose to these uh, social changes and they tried to sort of put their bury their heads in the sand I suppose but it didn't really <laughs> you know uh, work out at least uh, yeah, if you watch this movie uh, there's a bunch of other stuff we could talk about in regards to this movie uh, you know, a lot of people like to get into the uh, racial implication the gender uh, the feminism uh, there's a lot of feminism uh perspectives you could bring to this as well as all the other ones we've talked about but i think that we'll do it <laughs> again i want to keep this brief <laughs> uh, so anyway uh you know i do hope you enjoyed this lecture and enjoy the movie as well love to hear your thoughts on it especially if you want to uh you know talk about some of those other perspectives we've been you know talking about all this uh, semester and apply those to the movie you know i'd love to see what you uh, come up with but anyway we'll stop it here and i'll see you next time